Today, I have with me someone who potentially uh, might be hosting more and more episodes with us on, on the Shared Practices podcast. Now, this, the smart thing for me to do would be to go out and find another dentist who is like well-established, who has a following, maybe who's like really funny and try and get them to co-host the podcast with me. And instead, I went out and found someone who's like just as far off from practice ownership as I am. So I want to welcome Jake Stimmel. Jake, say hi. Hey, guys. How are we doing? And Jake, go ahead and, and, and tell us what's your situation right now and, and what's your background? Sure. Yeah. So so Richard was right. Um, he should have found someone that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> an established dentist and funny, um, which I'm not. Neither one of those. No, you're um, funny. You're just not established. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually a pre-dental student, uh, which sounds crazy. Um, but I, uh, was a musician for about 10 years, um, professional musician and, um, did that for a while and then, uh, ended up playing on cruise ships for a while. So I nice. was cruising around for about four years. Yep. And, um, there was a dentist on there and, um, kind of took me under his wing and I just, fell in love with it. And I've just been uh, reaching out to uh, different uh, podcast hosts and, and guests over the last, I don't know, year or so. And um, it's just been great. Like I met uh, with Dr. Uh, Costas and um, I tried to meet with Ferran. He, he's a busy guy, yeah, but, he um, is. you know, so it's just been fun. I've been blown away by how, um, just how nice everyone is and uh, helpful. So that's awesome. So you're you're a bit of a non-traditional pre-dental student in the fact that you kind of had a previous career, you're right. a little bit older, and you've got a little more wisdom and experience under your belt um, mm -hmm. compared to the guy who's, you know, just finishing up undergrad and he's 21, has never worked a job in his life, doesn't really understand what business is, but just knows he wants to be a dentist. You, you've got a different perspective. And more important than that, you've got a... Uh, a ton more initiative. Um, the fact that you've actually, so you've, you've met Mark Costas. I've only talked with him over the phone and been on his podcast. You've gone to um, Bruce Baird's uh, scheduling institute. Isn't that the? Yeah. The, uh, the PDA. The PDA. Uh, that's what it is. Productive. Yeah. Productive mm -hmm. Dentist Academy. And then uh, just like I said, uh, you've reached out to all these people and, and have a ton of initiative. You reached out to me and you, you basically said, how can I help? How can I, how can I help with your show? I'm, I'm, I love this idea. And, um, and I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. Someone who wants to help this, this would be awesome. So what we did is we went through and you listened to a whole bunch of different episodes from, from some different podcasts that have been generous enough to allow us to use clips from their show. And you've put together a, what we're going to call Metasode. Um, and then this one is about ownership. So it's kind of the, the theme of season one of our podcast. You've gone through other podcasts and pulled out the best of that. So we're going to listen to these clips together and then we're going to talk about them for a second and then we'll listen to the next one. And, and I love this because I think this is going to bring out some really great content from all these other shows. And we're going to, kind of be able to piece together an, an overall picture and, and reasons why we like these. So the first clip, I believe, is Alan Mead and um, Chris Salierno. That's right. Yep. And um, they're, they're kind of talking about um, just the new grad outlook. So, you know, what's the landscape out there? How are things looking? Um, you know, people are coming out of school with just a ton of debt. And um, so, yeah, so they just kind of talk about that and, and where things are going. Cool. So let's go ahead and listen to that one. Speaking of, uh, speaking of history, what do you think the outlook for new dentists is looking like? What do you, what do you from your viewpoint as an editor-in-chief and, a, and uh, kind of in touch with, with the dental world like that, what do you feel like for, for new dentists? Well, a couple things. I think that it's not a dreary future at all. I think that they have, if we're especially talking about the very recent grads, they're used to what many people, myself, Mark Vujicic, refer to as the new normal. So they're not coming out saying, oh, yeah, ho hum, it's, the office has been slow. This is just how it is for them. So they're not wasting time 
uh, pining for the days of yore. They're saying, all right, well, it, I'm as busy. This office is as busy as it is. Let me do better. And they're, I think, more natural, active business owners, uh, whereas some of the more established dentists are used to being uh, accustomed to being passive business owners. You show up, you do your dentistry, and there's a line, hopefully a line out the door, and you make great money. You have to be more active in this in this new uh, economy. And when and so you I say think new more, dentists are just accustomed to that. So in that sense, they're hitting the ground. I'm going to say this too: new dentists are also more comfortable with the idea of going into debt. Um, and that's, they don't have much of a choice. They don't have much of a choice, but you know what? Um, I look at, I look at the amount of money they're going into debt for, for school. And I go, Oh my God, I can't imagine that. But you know what? That's, that is, they knew that going in a lot. I don't know if they, they knew it in their head. They might not have understood it in their heart, but you know what I'm saying? Like they knew going in, it was going to be like that. And frankly, they also understand that, that to get ahead, they're going to have to, my dad and I've had this conversation. It's like, I don't think he and I probably would not in our situation now, that seems very brave, but it's also like, but in their situation, that's just the way that it is. You know, it's, it's kind of, you've got, you don't have a lot of choices. If you're going to be a dentist, that's kind of what you got to do. And so they don't, they don't sit there and, and sweat it because that's just the way that it is. You know, it's the way that it is. And I'll say to anyone that's listening to this right now, that is in that position where you're, you're, you've just graduated dental school. You're about to graduate. You're, you're in tremendous amounts of debt. If anyone tells you that you're in so much debt that you can't afford to purchase or start a practice, they're lying to you. Interesting. And there are people out there, I'm choosing my words carefully here, but there are um, non-dentists in particular out there who have a vested interest in informing, misinforming in my opinion, dentists to start to work for them. Uh, under the spell that they won't, no bank will give them a loan to start a practice or to buy a practice, and we know that's not true. You've got Bank of America, Wells Fargo. You have these these banks that have dental specific loans. Um, but for I I will tell you when I lecture to dental students around the country, and as to keeps me busy with that, I, I time and time again I have dental students that say to me, "Oh, but I, I I heard I can't I can't open a practice because I'm in so much debt." I said, who told you that? You know, and it's it's not true. It's Interesting. Not true. I think I think to some extent it's situational with regard to getting a loan, but like you say, it sounds like there's um some of the bigger some of the bigger institutions are are understand the same situation that these dental students understand that they're in too. And it's I, I, I'm not familiar. I haven't been there. And it seems like um I don't know. I guess there, like I said, I think that that the younger generation just has a certain understanding and comfort with you know the fact that they got to go into debt to to get where they want to go. So yeah, exactly. And and they should realize they're going to carry this debt for a long time. You know, another misunderstanding that that some of the dental students have is, uh, or the recent grads. Well, let me work somewhere wherever that may be and make a, a lot of money, and I'll just pay off my debt in a couple of years. And it's like <laughs> it's not going to work like that. You've got you know, you're three hundred thousand dollars in debt. You're going to have that debt for some time. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to need to pay for your own lifestyle and then whatever else is going on in your life. You just accept that you're going to have this debt for a, a, an extended period of time mm-hmm. and do other more important things with your money. Live a good life and invest in a, in a in your own practice and 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 you know and, and invest in the stock market and all these other kinds of things. That's interesting. I mean, that's kind of a uh, that goes against the grain. For, from what a lot of people are hearing, that's that's pretty cool, actually. Well, I think our parents' generation too was like debt is bad, and you got to get out of debt as quickly as as possible, no matter what. But not all debt is the same. There's, no, that's right. That's there's right. There's good debt, bad debt, educational debt, maybe a very big number, but it's good debt. It now enables you to provide and, and uh, for your family and 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 be a dentist and, and practice. Right. Bad debt is when you're like, Papa needs a Beamer. Let's do it. You know, and you're like, well. Maybe you don't need to drive a Beamer right out of school. You know, maybe probably probably you're... old bar bills from when you were senior in dental school that you're right. carrying. Probably not good debt. Just saying. Yeah, so you might have made that argument at the time, but probably not good debt long haul. Yeah, not good debt long haul. So, you know, living living a lifestyle beyond your means is unfortunately something I do see. Uh, it's a common mistake from recent grads. Hey, you know what? You're finally making a paycheck. Enjoy it. Totally, no question about it. But you know, getting into certain obligations, you know, maybe you don't need to run out and buy a house. Maybe you can rent for a few years and, and that's also not a waste of money. That's another perception that our, 
our generations and, and the millennials are, are beginning to understand is you can rent and that's not necessarily wasting your money. That's hard though, too, because when you've been in dental school and busting your ass for, for years, yeah. you kind of feel like I deserve this. I know I did. I know and I we did. see all our friends that are in, you know, the corporate world doing just fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I get it. I get it. It's tough. You got it. You got to think real hard about that and you got to, unfortunately, you got to be able to see the long, the long story, the big picture, you know, and that is a difficult thing to do to be sure. I'll tell a, a, a anecdote about my friend, uh, who's a, a periodontist and my friend drives a Range Rover. I drive a Honda Accord and whenever, uh, my lease is, is due, he's like, Oh, come on. You got to up your game. You got to, you know, at least drive a Beamer, at least, you know, up your game. And I'm like, you know, my friend, what do you drive again? It's like a Range Rover. I'm like, okay, how much a month is your payment for that Range Rover? And he says, it's a thousand dollars. I said, okay, I drive a Honda Accord. It's $300 a month. I get paid $700 a month to not drive a Range Rover. That's exactly right. Think, like I have, I have seven hundred dollars a month. That, listen, if you love cars and you really want a nice car, fine, get a nice car. But that kind of keeping up with the Joneses mentality. Hey, I'm a doctor. I got to go to the nicest golf club, you know, course, and this and that. That kind of thinking can lead to bad debt, and oh that gosh, yeah. is when someone gets trapped. Yeah, and that is when someone maybe can't be the entrepreneur that they that they want to be because they they just have a lot of bad debt that mm-hmm. they have to continue. To pay. Mm-hmm. It's and I mean I I can see as a young dentist that it's easy to get hung up in that. I mean, you got to really have someone who's got some perspective. Check your check your choices for a little while, just because it's so easy to fall into that. Because it it does feel like you deserve it too. Okay, so that was a clip between Alan Mead and Chris Salierno, and and I know Chris because of Alan. So they're, they're two of my favorite people, Dental Hacks Podcast. If you haven't listened to it, that's episode 44 of the Dental Hacks Podcast, and you'll get the full episode there. We'll also have a link to it in our show notes. So why did you choose this clip? What is it that stood out to you about this clip? Uh, you know, I think um, there were a couple things. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me was, um, you know, just how... I guess for lack of a better word, millennials are um, just a little bit less debt adverse. And so I, I was speaking with, um, so, so the dentist that got me in into dentistry um, when, when I was on the ship, he, he was reti- retired. So he graduated from UIC in the, I think the early sixties. Okay. And I was talking to him about, about debt. Cause I didn't know anything about dentistry. And I said, you know, Hey, how much does dental school cost? You know? And uh, he said, oh, I'm not really sure. You'll have to look that up. So I looked it up and, and I thought, okay, that's just what it costs. You know, sure. it costs $300,000. I didn't realize that. But then I talked to him and I said, well, how much did you, how much did you pay? And how much, what was your student debt when you came out? And he said, uh, it, it, I didn't have student debt. He said he, he came <laughs> out and, and he just, he didn't have any debt. And he said, I was like, that's amazing. He said, yeah. And I worked in the summers. Right. So. So he came out, I think he actually made money going to dental school. Oh my goodness. I know. So I was like, okay, well that's, that's pretty crazy. So I think, I think with our generation, um, there is kind of an understanding that it is an investment and they, they go into that a little bit with the, um, you know, the good, good debt versus bad debt thing. I mean, it's not like we are all going to the casino and, and racking up 300 K and going, well, I hope it works out. I mean, it's, I think it really is, um, an investment. So, so what do you like, what do you think of when you hear the term good debt versus bad debt? Like, you know, I've, I've heard that in other contexts before, and I think people have different understandings of that, but like, what does that mean to you? Good debt versus bad debt. So the way I think about it is good debt has the potential to get you to where you want to go. Whereas bad debt is buying, you know, depreciating assets or, um, things that aren't in the long term going to help you. So I think I think you have to be clear when you say good debt because people go, oh, good debt. Like n- now I can I've made that investment, and so now I can just accept whatever comes my way. And I think it's key to go. It's good debt, but you have to you have to leverage it and use it in a way um, that's going to get you to where you need to go. So, for example, with um, you know with this uh, dental 
you know, debt that I'm going to accrue about here to starting accrue. in about a year. Yep. Yeah. I, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm thinking I need to be an owner as soon as possible out of school. Um, because I think that, you know, and this is just for me personally, I think that, um, taking the associate route for a long period of time or my whole career, um, it would be difficult for me to leverage that debt in a way that makes sense um, to me financially. Yeah, for sure. Well, and um, so when I, when I think of this whole good debt versus bad debt, good debt is anything, like you said, it would be an appreciating asset or something that produces income. So like a house would be, would, would almost be like neutral debt because you're, it's not like by, by owning a house, you are earning money. It's not giving you cash flow. And, and sure, you're paying down the loan and, and you're building up equity. And those are all good things, but there's also maintenance and the price is volatile and all these other parts of it. You know, so, so a house would be like neutral debt to maybe, maybe good if, if it works out in your favor and maybe a little bad if, it, if you get screwed with the market timings and things like that. A car would be maybe towards that, that bad debt side of things because now you have a depreciating asset that as soon as you buy it, it's worth less. And then the longer you drive it, it's going to be worth less. So student loans are, are good debt because they're allowing you to produce more income. Um, and, and Howard Fran's famous for saying, you know, you could go work at McDonald's for 20 years and save up enough money to go to dental school. Or you could go to the federal government and they'll give you a loan and then you can work for 20 years as a dentist making four or five, 10 times as much as you would making at McDonald's and pay that back. And it's actually, you know, it's it's a phenomenal opportunity that we have to use other people's money to leverage our ability to produce income for the rest of our lives. And, and you know, they were talking about it. It, it is the cost of, of getting a dental education right now. Um, and so there's really no way around that. Um, and, and we, we have to be used to it. And I, I liked that he said to not get into this, this mental trap that you'll go and be an associate and work really, really hard for a few years and pay that down. Like maybe one out of 50 can find an associateship that is either is producing that much and, can live that low of a lifestyle where they can really aggressively pay down their student loans and within a period of four or five years, um, pay everything off. But, but you'd have to have, everything would have to line up and you'd have to have a phenomenal, you know, you're, you're making two, $300,000 type, type practice as an associate and, and you're not being an idiot and buying $150,000 worth of stuff every year. And you're actually, you know, living really cheap and, and, and paying all that down. So that for most people, that's not going to happen. So don't, don't get fixated in this. I have to pay off all my debt instantly. As soon as I get out of school, I'm not going to save in the stock market. I'm not going to invest in my own education. I'm not going to buy a practice. I'm not going to do any of these other financial good things until I've paid off my student loans. Um, mm-hmm. And and that really can be a trap and a fixation for people. Um, whereas going into ownership and, and what he said about people saying you can't afford to purchase, they're lying to you. And this is the second time, you know, I've, I've heard this voice and, and Jason Patrick Wood kind of said the same thing that these, there are corporate chains that have a vested interest in people thinking they can't own their own dental practice. Because if we all think that, then we're going to say, well, what's the best opportunity? I can't find any good associateships with these local dentists because they're not running their business maybe as well as they could be. Uh, so I'm going to go with these chains because at least they have the business side of things set up and, and I'm going to have enough patience and make some good money there. So they kind of want to keep us in the, in the, that ownership position or uh, in that, in that associateship position. So this was an awesome clip. And, and anytime you can hear Chris Salierno, uh, Alan gets the best out of them. It's, it's a great, great episode. So I thought that was awesome. So, okay. So what's, what's the next clip that we have coming up? Sure. So, um, the next clip is, um, uh, from Jonathan Van Horn's podcast. Okay. Um, and he's interviewing uh, Jason Patrick Wood. And if I'm sure a lot of people have heard of him, but if they haven't, he's um, he's a dental attorney, and he he kind of has a, uh, a penchant for uh, kind of um, 
polarizing people. Mm. So he's he he's really he's really upfront and he's very black and white, and that's what I appreciate about his perspective. Um, and in this clip, they're kind of talking about um, the differences between um, being an owner and an associate. So, okay. If you are sitting in the audience right now, going, I don't want to buy a practice. I don't want to do a startup. I'm totally fine with being an associate my, for my entire career. Um, you're part of the problem. And you're part of the reason why this industry is at a crossroads. Uh, I will tell you right now that what you think that you are getting, uh, job security, by working for somebody else is a complete crock. Uh, it's a complete farce. The, the easiest way to financial freedom from those student loan debts that you're so worried about is the acquisition of a practice and owning your own business. And, and it's not very difficult to walk you through the numbers here, but um, most, most associate doctors in a corporate or whatever they're going to make between 100 and 150 thousand dollars. There's there's definitely some rock stars that'll make up to 200. But let's let's just let's go crazy and say that you're going to make 200 thousand dollars as an associate every year. So first off, you're going to be an employee, and if you talk to Jonathan, he'll be able to explain to you the difference between being a business owner and an employee. And how much more you can stretch every single dollar being an, uh, an owner as opposed to being an employee. Um, uh, you know, that 200000 as an owner goes a lot longer, a lot further than an employee. Um, you know, and that's, that's one of the main reasons. And, and understand, remember, we're assuming 60% overhead. So what does that mean for us? That means that if you think that you can manage and own a practice that is generating Five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's not that's not a huge, giant machine we're talking about. We're talking about five hundred thousand dollars in yearly revenue. That's forty thousand dollars a month. Really, forty one, forty two, forty two thousand dollars a month in in overall collections in a practice. That means thirty thousand a month in doctor production. Which is like two thousand dollars a day if you if you yeah. have a sixteen day month or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this isn't. You don't have to be a rock star to make two hundred thousand dollars as an owner. You do need to be a rock star to make two hundred thousand dollars as working for a corporate. And then when you analyze that two hundred thousand, the owner makes a lot more money than the associate because of the tax benefits, the retirement plans, all these other aspects that you get as an owner as opposed to being an employee. Oh, and that's right. Making two hundred thousand as an employee, Jonathan will tell you, you get taxed at a much higher rate than maybe you might be able to as an owner. So he he can go into that more. Since this- <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, so you, you raise a lot of really good points, and you know, the is, you know, speaking to the fears that people seem to have is that um, you know one that it's too hard, they don't have the training. Well, number one, guys, we are in the day and age that there is probably a software program that does 90% of the administrative things that you need to do. Long gone are the times of having to actually keep, you know, a physical checkbook of every little thing that's going on or some giant ledger pad that right. you know, has, you know, 10 checks and balances within it. Uh, you know, technology is, is here and it's making things easier from a business administration standpoint. I mean, we're, Jason and I are talking through the magic of the internet, you know, from, you know, halfway across the country that you're listening to and probably a phone. I mean, it's technology has made this being a business owner easier. Now, um, people issues are always going to be a harder thing to do deal with, but experience will typically lead you past that over time. And then oh, like we said, I mean, you talk about people issues. Yeah. You're going to have to manage staff. Well, let me ask you this. How often do we do we hear horror stories of in you know just either a solo practice associate or in a corporate practice associate and the office manager is telling them what to do and the the treatment coordinator is telling them what to do when they are against that type of treatment when you're the owner guess what you call all the shots okay so in that clip 
This was uh, which episode of Jonathan Van Horn's? I know he didn't number them for a while. Yeah, um, I, f- I forget the actual name of the clip, but I know it's um, January 28th, 2016. January 28th. Okay, and we'll have a link to that. You know, both you and I are huge fans of Jason Patrick Wood, and he he did some of those numbers and some of those calculations in in our interview with him. But I, I love every single time he does that because I pick up on different things. And he actually said some things in here that uh, I don't think he said in, in my interview. So I was really glad he pulled this out. So for you, what were some things that stood out in that clip? Yeah, there. so for me, the, the two biggest things were um, the financial incentives. Of okay. Ownership over associateship. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, he just made it really clear that um, if you if you have the same if you work the same amount, so let's say that you work, you know, 32 hours a week, you know, and, and, uh, like how many ever weeks per month and how many ever days per year. Um, and, and, and you take that like input and whether you're an owner or an associate, you're going to get a totally different output. And I thought that that was really interesting that you could, um, you know, as, as an owner, you're getting whatever profit the the business has um so whatever is left over at the end of the year and then you're also getting a cut of hygiene um, you're getting a lot of tax incentives um there was just so many things where i was like wow like you know you can you can work the same and make make double um which is for me right now is is pretty motivating yeah no for sure and and i love when he runs through those numbers i love that he he breaks it down to you don't have to be a rock star as an owner to make good money. Whereas an associate, you, you really do have to be a rock star. It, and, it, and I don't think a lot of people realize that the, not the cap, but you know, it's, it's rare to find associates that are making over 200,000. Uh, whereas an owner, I think it, it might even be, I don't want to say this cause I don't, I don't, I don't honestly know, but if you can make 2k a day, in in production as an owner, it's fairly reasonable to make two hundred thousand dollars as an as an owner. And in fact, that that cap that ceiling can be raised a lot easier as an owner. Um, the the thing he said right at the very beginning, he said the easiest way out of debt is through ownership. That's kind of like the thesis of my podcast of season one in particular is is that the reason it's worth it to be an owner is to get out from underneath all of this. And then the the all the other benefits of ownership and the fact I love that he says um, he addresses the people issue, you know, the people skills. A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to manage people. I don't want to have the headaches of hiring and firing and having a staff that I have to train and lead. But he, you're always going to have to deal with people. I, I, I have, you know, people issues galore in in the army and that, you know, sometimes we're short staffed or we, we don't have control over who our assistants are or, um, you know, the, the proper channels to go through to get this person corrected um, aren't as efficient as they could be. And so sure. whether you're in the army, whether you're an associate, whether you're, you know, doing your own thing, there's always going to be people issues. The real question is how much control do you have over those people issues? And as an associate, you've got an owner, you've got a you know, practice manager, a, a financial person, the assistants, all of whom may or may not um, like you and, and may or may not be under your control. And, and, and same thing with uh, as an owner, you've got all these people, but at least you have the final say and you can train or get rid of these people or um, you know, surround yourself with the culture and the people that you want. And that was one of the biggest benefits of ownership that uh, a lot of the dentists I've spoken with have said is that creating that culture and having that control over your environment uh, makes it all worth it for them. Um, okay, so next clip, what do we have next? Sure. So um, this is a Howard Ferran clip. Um, and he's, he's talking with um, two guys who are recent graduates, um, 2012, I think. And, um, one is, uh, Jay Elliott and the other is Johnny Brennan and they're actually brothers, which I thought was kind of neat. That's cool. Um, and they, they, uh, so the, the clip is about, uh, kind of their startup and Ferran is, is kind of asking, you know, what are some of the qualities in an owner? How can someone sort of, um, look at themselves and go, Hey, sh- am I ready for this? Am I not ready for this? What, which episode was this? 
Sure. It was uh, number 247. 247. Okay. Awesome. More of that after the break, but first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, now that you've realized that your neck hurts, the next part that should frustrate you about your current pair of loops is that there's this wasted space between the bottom of the frame and and where it's comfortable to look down. So I want you to look down when you're wearing your loops. So look below the loops below the frame. And and if you look down really far, like as far as you can without moving your head, eventually that's that's strain, that's uncomfortable. You can't have the loops that far down. You can't you can't hold that for a while. There's this whole zone of comfortable space between the bottom of the frames and where the loops could be placed that's wasted because of your current frame. Q Optics has designed not only a, a new frame, but also a way of, of measuring the space of your face. They actually take like a face bow of you and take a picture of it and put it in the computer. There's this little contraption with green dots that you wear on a pair of glasses. And they take a photo from the front and a photo from the side. And they've got some fancy names for it. But essentially, they're doing a map of your face, a 3D map of your face, and maximizing the amount of frame that can dip down and they can put loops in. Why wouldn't you maximize that for every single person? Well, it's easy. It's easier to to just buy a bunch of preset frames than it is to make custom frames for everybody. So if you're interested in, in maximizing the real estate that you have available, you can send an email to sales at qoptics.com with the promo code SP16 for $100 off a pair of loops or $300 off of a loop and light combo. It's time for you to stop wasting all that space. You're talking to thousands of dentists right now, and a lot of them are fourth-year kids in dental school listening to podcasts. In fact, a lot of them tell me they're listening to this during dental school, sitting in the back row. Um, Describe to this individual some red flags that lets them know if they are the entrepreneur type that would probably want to be their own boss or if they're the type like Tanner that would just rather just go in and do dentistry. What d- describe, describe some traits so this person can look in the mirror and decide which one they really are. Because what you want to believe about yourself, like I believe I look exactly like Marky Mark, but other people tell me I don't. So, yeah. so describe to this person um, – I, I think one of the first things that came to my mind, it, it can be viewed as a, a derogatory term, but I don't view it that way, that there's an intensity. There's an intensity to um, the two of us and others that I've seen that when they graduated, they hit the ground and they said, I want practice ownership. It's in my future. If not today, at some point, I, I have an intensity about the way I want to set up my office, the instruments I want, the um, materials that I'm using. There are some DSOs out there or bigger organizations that do blend a little bit more to the dentist, but generally speaking, unless it's your baby, you don't get to call the shots on all those things. And if that matters to you a lot, you're very intense about, I need it to be this way. I want things my way or the highway. <laughs> then ownership's really the only way you get to go where you get to say, that's what I want my logo to look like. I don't like that shade of green. I want to change that just a little bit. Yeah. And I, I think you have to see some of those realities. You're about to graduate with that kind of, of debt load. So the trouble there actually becomes people lending you exorbitant amount of money to do what you want to do. Um, you need to look at, look at the type of career that you want. I knew I wanted to stay here around Arizona. So some of the Heartland or some of the more corporate dental places that wanted to plug me down in Midwest uh, America wasn't going to work. And then I knew I wanted to establish early on the practice I was going to show up for 30 plus years. This is where I'm going to be. Um, so if you have a lot of those desires, the quicker you can get to it, the better. Um, Cause I found I couldn't do it the first year out of dental school. No one would lend me the money. I didn't have production reports, what I could produce and the kind of work I could do. Um, so it took me two or three years to walk to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, anybody and say, hey, I am the dentist I claim to be. I, I have learned some things and can do some stuff. So um, if, if you have all of that drive and those desires to, to be in control truly, to not have a boss, um, the way you have to do is right out the chute, you have to, you have to make a plan. And we're a little bit different. We, we share the burden or the, the debt load that we have with the practice and we kind of split the hours. If 
you know, a startup dental practice, and we started from scratch eight months ago. Um, a startup dental practice is not profitable right away. So the two of us were kind of working for free for a while, and it takes a lot of hard work. But if, if you have all those desires, you just need to plan and have the right things in place. And we can talk more about those red flags, but that's just kind of a quick answer is it's what we wanted. It's what we always wanted. The reason I went into dentistry was a sophomore year. I already had a 10-year plan. So how am I not out of dental school going to go? I got another 10-year plan where I'm in the driver's seat at the 10-year mark. Okay, so that was great. So what were, what were their names again? I missed that. Sure. Uh, the first guy's name was Jay Elliott. And the second guy is uh, Johnny Brennan. And what, what made that stick out to you? I think the most important thing um, that I got from that is that um, Howard Ferran doesn't look like Marky Mark. Um, <laughs> I think, in my mind, he's more of a Brad Pitt, um, which sure. I think is great. Yeah, whatever. So he, he's you know he's got good friends. Um, they're they're real honest. So yeah. I, <laughs> um, probably my my favorite part of that episode or that uh, little clip was the uh, the intensity mindset. Sure. So I think that word intensity can maybe scare people. Like if if, if you don't feel like you're an intense person, um, that can be a little scary. But I think it's more of um, kind of goes back to the whole idea of having a plan and a vision. And they, mm. and they touched on that a little bit at the end of the clip. Um, and I think, I think for me, that's, that's so important, you know, it's, it's not about necessarily having, um, an A to Z guide where you go, okay, step one, do this. Step two is this, um, for me, it's more, I know what my, my 10 year plan is and where I want to be in 10 years. So I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there, but I think having that clarity of what it's going to look like when you do get there, I think is the most important piece. And though these guys really um, seems like they have that together. Well, and I think uh, that that idea of the intensity or someone who really wants it mm -hmm. is going to have the 10 year plan. I think a lot of people who don't have 10 year plans either don't have a clear direction or maybe they don't want it bad enough to do the research and to figure things out and to move aggressively in that direction. So it all kind of goes together. I think looking forward takes a lot of work when you don't know how to get where you want to go. Um, and so a lot of people are just like, well, I don't know how to be an owner. So, I, you know, like, I just, I don't know. I don't know the first thing about that. Where would I even find out the information about that? And, you know, maybe they don't realize that podcasts exist or that's just not a format that appeals to them or they don't, they don't get on dental town or, you know, so there's a lot of people don't have this information just given to them on a plate. And so unless they have that intensity and they really want it and they make a 10 year plan and then they figure out how we're going to get there, um, they don't get there as quickly. Maybe they still get there eventually, uh, but it, they take a few more detours. So I, and I loved that idea that y you, you create that plan and you move forward and, and you want it and you're intense about it. It's still going to be hard. You're still going to have, if you're doing a startup, you're still going to have times where you're not making a ton of money right up front and you better have some money set aside. And so those intervening years leading up to doing a startup, you should be setting money aside so that you've got a solid six months of runway for yourself that you don't have to make money from your business. You can just build it, build it, build it, build it to the point where, okay, now it's starting to, you know, spit out cash and, and, and provide for my family. So that was, that was a great clip. Let's see, what, what do we have next? What's the, the next clip that we've got lined up? Sure. So um, actually, this is another clip from uh, the same interview with Jason Patrick Wood. This is on uh, Van Horn's. Um, you, just, you just can't get enough, Jason. I can't, I, you know, I can't get enough. And uh, spoiler alert, we've got another one coming up. Oh, so, uh, man. <laughs> uh, so this one is great. Um, they're kind of at this point in the interview talking about finding finding a practice that's right for you. Um, so he kind of talks about how, um, you know, one practice might be great for one dentist and it might be not so great for another dentist. So figuring out who you are as a dentist and what you bring to the table. Cool. Okay. Let's go into that. Let's, let's talk real, real quick. Again, if you have any insight on this, I'd love to hear it. Um, uh, to the person in the crowd that is, they, they want to own a practice, but they're looking for the right practice. You know, you talked about how you've got to find the right practice. And especially like here in Arkansas, it can be really difficult to find practices that are available that aren't 
those three to four hundred thousand dollar practices. Uh, they're generating revenue in that realm. That you know, all, it's always the guy that says, "Oh, it's a, it's a retiring dentist. He's he's been taking the time off, and he only works you know three days a week, and he only he does four hundred thousand dollars a year." And I have to tell that person, "Well, that's not very much money for three days a week." But um, you know, how how if you were a dental, if you were a, a someone in the crowd that was wanting to buy a dental practice but couldn't find the right practice, how would you approach? finding a dental practice. Do you have any advice on that? Well, that, that's a great question. And, and I mean, keep in mind that I'm not saying don't buy the $300,000 practice. It's just, you got to have a plan. You can't mm -hmm. be, you got to be associating somewhere else. You got to be, you got to be analyzing that $300,000 $300, practice. And yes, if there's an $800,000 practice available, I would prefer you to take the 800,000, but we don't live in a perfect world. And so sometimes, yeah, Sometimes you have to be associating while you've purchased a smaller practice. But even then, I want you analyzing that small practice. You may find a variable gold mine because a doctor is 75. He's been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for, you know, these things to develop. And he's just a, a, a patch and wait doctor. There could be, there could be, a million dollars in revenue in that in that type of practice. So you really need to analyze every single practice you you look at. You got to analyze. That's why when people say, "Oh, but you do this all the time," uh, you know, so this isn't that much work for you. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, because if I look at you know five different practices every day, there's going to be significant differences in each practice because you know we, we're dealing with. We're dealing with personalities. We're dealing with different treatment uh, philosophies. We're dealing with, you know, uh, different patient bases, different, you know, uh, local environments, all these aspects. And so you start you start getting into all these different um, issues, and, and therefore no two practices are alike. And so um, you don't necessarily need to find the right practice because understand there's never the perfect practice. Um, where I see people running into is they they get all excited about bells and whistles. Oh, it's got a serif machine. Oh, it's got ADAC chairs and this and that. Well, I don't care about that. What what I care about is is their cash flow. Are they are they doing uh, a good job of managing their staff, managing the patients, managing their schedule, all these other aspects, so that when you get in there, you're hitting the ground running. Um, so if, if the perfect practices aren't available, then yes, I would look at how does this practice look for me? Not, not as, as if I'm the owner, but how does it look for me personally? Are there areas that I can expand upon? Are there things that just by me being who I am, I'm going to have a more profitable practice? Is there room for growth? Is there only two operators? Is there five operators? Uh, is the real estate for sale? Because if, if all these other aspects are, are there and the real estate is for sale too, that's a huge plus. Because you're going to be, again, you're going to be on a different financial plateau by being able to own as opposed to renting. So all of these things, they, they come into play. That's why it cannot be an emotional decision. It has to be a rational decision. It has to be a financial decision. So, um, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, definitely try to find the practices that meet your qualifications in terms of where you rank um, from an associate production standpoint. But if you can't find that because there's just not those practices around, then by all means, start looking lower, but keep that job that you've got until you grow the practice. Okay, so another another Jason Patrick Wood clip with Jonathan Van Horn. What did you like about this one? There was a few things that stood out to me. Yeah, so one of the things that I thought was great was um, kind of separating, uh, and, and we had talked about this um, from another clip, but separating the emotion from business mm. decisions. Um, so when he was talking about practices, um, and he mentioned, you know, oh, this practice has a, a CRAC, and, and this one's got a CAD cam, and this one's got so-and-so microscope and you know and he's like i don't care about any of that what's the cash flow um what's the new patient um you know 
like are there a lot of new patients um you know like what are the financials looking like and i and i thought that was really interesting because um and i don't think it's just a you know like a younger generation kind of thing it's people get you know caught up in the bells and whistles as he put it and i think it's important to understand that um when you're making business decisions it has to be um you know uh, data driven and less emotional for sure uh i thought that was great and and it's so true it's like oh but they have a serac and they have a comb beam and they have a laser you know that you can get really caught up mm-hmm. on some things that well maybe they're selling the practice because it's not profitable and they've got all these bills <laughs> and whistles um the thing that i really liked that that stood out to me this time was was like a step back from the advice i've been hearing from jason so he's he's pretty polarizing as we've said uh but he has been very strong about recommending to not buy a smaller practice, a $300,000, $400,000 practice, because his big thing is if you can produce $500,000, $600,000, but you buy $200,000, $300,000 $300, practice, first off, there's not a lot of room for error in a smaller practice. Um, mm-hmm. if, if, things, if you lose a, a sizable chunk of the patient base right off the bat, or, you know, because they loved the old owner so much, or, you know, they're, they're shopping around at that point, and you already had a small practice, or you have a slow month with a small practice, that wiggle room kind of disappears, uh, depending on, on where the overhead is. Whereas a bigger practice, you can take home a lot more and ride out the bumps a lot better. And if you can produce that, you're going to produce even more as an owner versus an associate. But this is the first time that he's gone back and been a little bit more reasonable about his advice because he he convinced me, him and a few other people, uh, it was probably six months ago before I was starting my podcast, I just kept hearing this idea that don't buy a small practice, don't buy a small practice, buy the 800,000. If you can produce that much, that's what you should be buying. So I, I like finally internally agreed with it because for a long time I was thinking, oh, I'll, I'll wait for a deal. I'll scoop up a deal of a practice and then build it up and, you know, I'll, I'll have the hidden value there that I can add to it. And, and so they convinced me, don't, don't look at that as your first option, but this is where he's gone back. And he's actually said, okay, fine. If you aren't going to buy the big practice, you know, the, the perfect practice is never going to come along. So say that you're going to, you're going to buy something that's a little smaller he said, keep your side job, keep your associateship, have another office where you can be working so that while the practice is still only producing 300,000, you can build it up and scale it up without having to rely on that income um, because you've got a side gig. So I, I, I thought this was a great clip. I'm glad you found this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I think it's it's interesting that you said that because um, I had, uh, I've been listening to uh, Dr. Mark Costas. I've been listening to him for a while and um, his, his kind of story was that, you know, he, you know, he had six practices that he bought in the first year or two out of school. And, um, and he's kind of talked about it a lot where he said, you know, I targeted, um, practices that were in that range, the 250, 300, 350 range. And then he would build them up to a million dollar practice and then sell them off. of sure. And that to me, I was like, Oh, well, that's the way you do it then. That's sure. what everyone should do. And, this clip, then when I, you know, the, this clip and others, when I heard Jason Patrick Wood talk about, well, no, you should really buy practices that are, um, you know, more in the seven, 800 range. Um, don't buy the 300, you know, thousand dollar practices. I thought, well, that's interesting. And I could kind of seeing both of their perspectives, it made me realize, you know, there isn't really a right answer. There's just what's right for you and what's your skill set. If, if you have the ability to buy a $300,000 practice, and you see, you look at the data again, and you see that, um, you know, maybe the marketing isn't right, or the overhead is at, you know, 87%, or, or there's things that you can quickly um, fix, then maybe that could be the right, the right purchase for you. No, oh, absolutely. And that idea of the right practice for you, and also mm-hmm. that there is no right answer. I mean, there's so many different ways to do this. The biggest thing is being informed and understanding what are the pros and cons of doing it this way. Um, mm-hmm. And if you if you know going in that a smaller practice, um, you know, has these issues and it is going to be hard to take a two hundred thousand dollar practice to a million dollar practice, a lot harder than it would be to take a seven hundred thousand dollar practice to a million dollar practice. 
if you understand, you know, the work ahead of you and the opportunities that are there and how that fits with you and your personality and your skill set, then that's great. But, you know, full steam ahead. And and, and otherwise, you know, you just got to educate yourself. So cool. Anything else that stood out on, on that clip you wanted to mention? No, that's great. Um, I think we're ready for the next one. Okay. Perfect. So um, the next clip is uh, Dental Hacks again. Uh, love these guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. So we've got episode 44. So this is going to be with, um, uh, it's a kind of a continuation of uh, the interview with Chris Salierno. Um, okay. So, and if anyone forgot, he's the guy that sounds like Ed Helms. So. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been on he's been on our show anyways okay well perfect yeah he's, he's awesome <laughs> okay here we go so you were talking a little bit earlier about uh passive business owners versus active ones go i want you to dig a little deeper on that for me my first gig when i got out i worked for a couple of dentists and um one of them was what i would call the quintessential passive owner he was in his uh, let's say mid to late 50s he had practiced starting in the early 80s, um, so he went through the 80s, went through the 90s. Certainly a nice time to be a dentist. I think we would all agree. Um, you didn't have to be an active business owner. In fact, sometimes some of the things that would we would the, the traits that we now uh, highly regard were were admonished back then. For example, being an aggressive marketer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, any kind of marketing was aggressive, uh, at, you know, in the, in the 80s. You just didn't do that. It was distasteful. And now we know that there's tasteful ways to do it. Anyway, so he was a passive business owner. And as the as the research from the ADA has shown, the there's been a decrease in, in dental spending on dentistry, especially by adults, decrease in adult dental visits since the early 2000s. It, we cannot blame the Great Recession of 2008 for a decrease in dental visits. Unfortunately, because that that event happened, I think a lot of, of existing uh, established practices are blaming their slowness on that when their slowness was happening years before then. So this dentist I worked for was a prime example. I, you know, this is 2006, 2007, and, uh, you know, his hygiene schedule is starting to fall apart. He's only seeing a couple patients a day. And there were a lot of things he could have done to, I think, turn the business around. You know, not even just marketing, just sprucing the place up. It hadn't been redesigned mm -hmm. since 1985. Um, I know this because there was a poster in his main operatory that said Art Expo New York 1985. <laughs> it was not a vintage poster. It yeah, had been there that since was when, <laughs> That was when it was new, exactly. That was when it was brand new, yeah. And so he would, you know, sit in his office on his computer and, you know, the hygienist would come in and say, hey, I, my one patient canceled, so I actually don't have any patients today. And he'd just kind of shrug his shoulders and go back to his fantasy baseball league. And I'm like, man, like I just graduated and I know like we should be doing something. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I knew nothing about business when I just graduated. But I was like, I feel like we should be doing something. Um, so that's what I mean by a passive versus an active business sure. owner. And it's I I can only imagine it's tough for the the people that are in there, the you know who are established who are say twenty plus years in practice. It's hard for them to completely change the way they think. It's hard for them to spend money on things they didn't have to spend money for in mm -hmm. the past. But the the perceptions of the public have changed. This is the new normal in terms of dental spending. They're going to have to rethink a lot of uh, of aspects of their business model and be, become more engaged and involved in in how their business is run. And when I think of active, what you're talking about with active, I think, I mean, first and foremost, marketing, but also sure. I think some of the things that we were talking about earlier, like, like, uh, uh, you know, writing a blog or, or, you know, sort of being an educator, a patient educator, a podcast, something like that. I mean, it doesn't all have to be that you're spending money on, on a new website or that you're, you know, doing mailers or anything like that. There's no, I mean, and it's, it's just having an active mindset for me, the, the quintessential business mindset is ready, fire, aim. It's not have, and there's a book with that title. So I'm not even, I, I, I can't take credit for it, but it's not ready, aim, fire. The problem is you can get paralysis by analysis as another term that they use. You can spend forever aiming. Oh, mm -hmm. all right, we're going to try this, but maybe we should do it this way. I, I don't know. And then nothing ever gets done. You have an idea, just do it. And if it fails, then reevaluate and say, well, let's not do it again. Or maybe we'll try it a little differently. 
uh, the, that's the aim part. The aiming comes up. Just do it. Just try stuff. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to spend a little money on something that doesn't work. Um, so that that's one of the main philosophical, you know, I think changes that people have to undergo. What specifically can they do? Yeah, marketing and, and developing a Facebook page, developing systems so that the Facebook pages can be managed well. And, you know, Jason's an expert on this. But there's other things too, like how many dentists – don't know what a profit and loss statement is. And their accountant hands it to them and they go, okay, well, numbers are up since last year. I guess that's good. You know, They don't know how to break it down and, and extract from that what their overhead is for their staff and for their lab bill and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And then take that very powerful information and say, all right, you know what? My lab bill should be between 20, uh, you know, uh, 10 and, and 12% uh, percent of, of my, my net. Um, or my gross rather. So I'm actually at 20%. Hmm. Yep. Well, let's be a, an active business owner. What do I do about that? Well, I can call the lab and try to negotiate better fees and say, Hey, I, I give you a lot of business. What can we do? I can look to use another lab. I can raise my fees. I can so on and so forth. But just having those questions, that's being an active. Yeah. Business. Having the information gives you an option to make some changes in a lot of different ways. That's definitely true. And where do you look? I mean, if you if you have a practice management software uh, like I do, it's there's almost overwhelming how many reports can yeah. be generated, and and that's part of what we're what we like to do now in, in dental economics is I'm giving specifics. We have articles written like print this report, look at these numbers. It should be this. We just need to be better about educating ourselves about those kinds of details. I can give a great lecture that that gets everyone all whooped up about. Let's be active business owners, and everyone goes yay, and then we all go home, and you're like, okay, so how do I do that again? Mm-hmm. So you know, we have to be very specific in in in, in what we're educating up about. Okay, another awesome clip with Chris Salierno and, and uh, Alan Mead. What what stood out to you on that one? Yeah, I love this uh, ready, fire, aim concept. Um, and you know, funny enough, I actually that, that's a book by uh, Michael Masterson, and uh, I. Th- yeah, I think I, gosh, I think I read that book. Um, oh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, so I, I, when he said that ready fire aim, I thought, oh, that's Michael Masterson. Um, and as an aside, uh, that the book is funny because the, the title is ready fire aim. And then the subtitle is, it's something silly. It's like from zero to a hundred million dollars in a year or something. It's some crazy, you know, sure. number where you're just like, oh, uh, sure. okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, I love it. There's, there's another dentist, um, that really, I think embodies that concept and it's, uh, Dr. Anissa Holmes. Uh, mm. She talks about that a lot of just this idea that dentistry sort of selects for perfectionists, right? Sure. Um, and I, I think that a lot of times, um, I mean, especially academically, you know, throughout our, uh, you know, K through 12 college, uh, dental school, we, we want everything to be perfect. That's sort of like beat into our head that you don't move and you don't, uh, finish something until it's exactly right. And I think that business ownership is just inherently not that way. You gather the best information that you can, and then you act, you make a decision. And the key is to um, be self-aware enough and to to gather enough data that after you act, you can look back and kind of go, how did it go? You know, did hmm. it work? Um, did it not work? And then make corrections. Absolutely. The For me, this really hits home because with this podcast and this little side gig that I'm doing like I want it to be really 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 good and I want to have it all planned out I want these perfect interviews and like Mm -hmm. it's just nothing's ever perfect and so you just got to do something and and you're right like Dr. Anissa Holmes she's one that um she's making me want to get on and do some Facebook live even though that like that's a little bit out of my comfort zone you know to just get on there live and and do the live video I think uh there's like nothing to lose, you know, even if it sucks, whatever. Oh like, yeah. No hey, cares. you know what? In, embrace the suck. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's going to be imperfect, but if you're, if you're trying to benefit others, it's, you're going to learn from it and, and hopefully someone finds some value out of it. So, but, yeah. but I liked a lot of things he said. He, I liked how he talked about marketing and how, you know, if, if there's nothing going on in your practice, you, you got to start looking around and saying, okay, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And that's the idea of engaged business owner versus a passive business owner. And, and it's just, I don't want to say it this way, but sometimes 
being an employee or being an associate or being in the army, being, you know, in, in different situations, when patients just show up on your books, when you just show up to work, there's a patient in the chair, you didn't have to like market or set up the systems for people to call in and, and to, to learn about you and all of that. You can get into this idea of, yeah, that's just how it works. That's just, you know, patients just show up. They just want dental care. Um, yeah, sure. And that attitude um, can be something you have to get over once you get into to ownership and into, you know, having your own practice. And so it's a great point to bring up, not only in terms of kind of the older generation being more passive owners, sure, maybe they were, but um, but more importantly, just within ourselves to notice that when am I being passive about this and just saying, oh, this is how it is versus I can make a difference. We can make this better. Let's let's market. Let's do this, that or the other and, and to make it happen. Absolutely. I think a lot of it has to do with perception, too, and, and getting outside of ourselves. So, you know, when, when we think about active versus passive, it's, you know, how do I feel today? Well, I don't really feel like, you know, um, you know, trying to reach out to patients, you know, say we had a gap in our schedule. Well, I, don't, I don't really feel like doing that. I'm just going to play fantasy, you know, baseball or whatever. Right. It is. But there, there's 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 that just how we feel. But then there's uh, this other piece, which is how the team perceives us, you know. And so if, uh, if you set this precedent where, you know, let's say that you are an owner and you have, you know, this gap and you're just playing your fantasy league, you're having a great time and your hygienists, they're, they're walking by and they're seeing you doing that. And then so now you've set this precedent where that's kind of the, uh, the status quo for the office. Yeah. And, and that's really hard to break out of. Um, once, once a pattern has been established, once the status quo has been established, um, you know, even in this last year, like I, I got into a few bad habits and my assistant got into a few bad habits with how we started our morning and, and when we were scheduling. I think, uh, you know, she wanted to get to work and have her coffee and eat her oatmeal before seating that first patient. And so she started scheduling yeah. people later and later. And I didn't call her out on it as soon as it happened. Um, and And so then it became a pattern. It became established that Instead of at 7.30, we had patients at, at 8. And, you know, you, you could say, oh, we're supposed to be doing our morning huddle. Well, no, that was supposed to be at 7.20. So things get mm-hmm. pushed back and, and people will start to drift with their what they're taking advantage of. And then that becomes the new normal. And the sooner you correct that, the easier it is. Um, you can always do it later. But, but as soon as you kind of call it out, then you also have the advantage of setting a precedent of noticing when things are awry versus, oh, well, let's see what I can get away with with, with my doctor and, and see how far we can get. So, okay, cool. So there's one more clip to wrap it all up. Sure. Um, and, and we're actually going to go back to uh, JPW. Oh, yeah. He's affectionately termed. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, and actually this is from, um, it's from that same clip. I promise that I listened to a, a lot of different interviews. Sure you this did. one was just really you good. You just listened to three episodes. And now <laughs> you're going to call it a metasode. Totally. People are like, uh, this guy's kind of a hack. So, um, but I, I promise I did. But uh, anyway, this, <laughs> this one kidding. is, um, um, he's kind of talking about different ways to uh, track down um, a dental practice. So, so you, you know, you figured out which one you, you want to buy. You figured out you've got this business plan. Now you're in the looking phase and they kind of talk about um, different ways to find practices. Okay, cool how do people find those practices that they were trying to acquire? What is, how do they find the opportunity? So, um, what you can always go to brokers, but you got to know which brokers are reputable, which ones are not. Uh, good luck with that one. Um, the, uh, what I always say is, um, there, there's, there's pros and cons, but, um, you know, there's, there's places like dental town, where there's there's you know classified ads for for sale by owners. There's your your uh, state dental society, your local dental society. This is where remember I was talking about your supply reps and equipment reps. Those people can also tell you about off market practices. Um, but it really depends upon your area. If you're a seller in Arkansas, for instance, it's going to be much harder to sell your practice if you're trying to do it on your own as opposed to listing with a broker. And so, but if you're in, say, Chicago or Minneapolis or New York City or San Francisco or San Diego, wherever, you're going to have such a high demand for your practices that you don't 
always need to sell go with a broker. Um, so I would say, you know, if 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 you're a buyer looking at a for sale by owner, understand that there are some unique complications. Typically, for sale by owners um, have an unrealistic expectation of what the value of your, their practice is. Um, they may not understand how to do the, the sale, um, so you may incur additional advisor fees as a result of that. Not, not a lot more, but, um, you know, you're just, there's going to be a lot more hand-holding. Um, it's going to be a bumpier ride because there's, there's more work that the buyer has to do, um, you know, that, and don't get me wrong, there's, you know, going with broker practices, as long as it's a reputable broker, is a great avenue for a buyer as well. You're going to have, uh, you know, a, a, a practice that all the information is available, that it's reasonably priced for the area, that you're going to have procedure breakdowns, and you're going to have tax returns, you're going to have all these other aspects that make it very simple, easier to determine whether or not this is the right practice for you. Um, so there's a lot less work involved from a, not, not a due diligence standpoint, but from a, basically having to, to grab all the information from all these other aspects. So, um, so I mean, the, so brokers, you know, good, reputable brokers uh, looking at their websites, uh, please stay away from brokers that are ethically challenged. Um, just trust me on this. Um, uh, dental Town, uh, your state dental society, uh, your local dental society, CPAs that are in the field, uh, other advisors that are in the field, uh, supply reps, equipment reps, all these people are great avenues. So Get out there and, and talk to people is what you're saying. Yes, yes. For all you introverts out there, yes, we have to talk to people. You know, that, 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 sound, that, that sounds so easy. And I bet you there's a couple of people out there that have been thinking about all these things and trying to find a practice. And we just spoke to you to say, you have our permission to go and talk to somebody about buying a practice. Yeah. Go to your study club. Because the best practices I've found that I've had clients acquire was through some third connection. So like through through... Um, if it's a private seller, they told somebody they're interested in selling and they told their study group and then they had like five people approach them. This, this last clip is kind of like a little teaser of, you know, where this podcast eventually is going and looking at buying your practice and, and moving forward. And there's this idea of a broker practice, you know, where it's listed, it's already got a broker representing it. Um, it's the more traditional way to find a practice. and it can sometimes have the perception that like, you know, not that you're getting screwed, but also it's just that um, sometimes it can be harder to deal with if it's, if it's a broker who's trying to hide things or is trying to make the practice sure. look better than it really is, which, you know, as a seller, you want to sell your practice and you want to sell it for the highest dollar value possible. And so some people can get into some questionable methods of making that happen and making their practice stand out. So I think that's what people are worried about. And so then the flip side of that is this, this uh, hidden, unknown, unlisted practice that, you know, is, is a handshake type deal where, you know, a buddy of a buddy has a practice to sell and then you don't have to get brokers involved and all of this stuff. I thought it was great that he highlighted some of the disadvantages of that. Um, sometimes if they don't have anyone representing them and they don't have, they haven't done a proper analysis of their practice. They might have these expectations of what it's worth, or they don't want to use professionals. They want to keep it, you know, just a handshake type thing. And th that can be as much of a challenge as the ethically challenged broker. So, you know, there's pros and cons sure. either way. Um, and if, if you're going to buy straight from someone that you still need to do all the due diligence and you might have to help them understand the importance of that. Uh, so I thought this is a kind of a, a balanced look at both those off off market deals and also the traditional route of, okay, going through a broker and making sure you're doing it the right way. So Yeah. I, and I thought the same thing. I thought that 
um, <clears throat> just having that different perspective is good, um, which is which in a lot of ways kind of um, nicely wraps up this episode because um, that's kind of the idea behind all this stuff is, um, you know, you want to have different ways of thinking about um, a situation. So like when I was talking about, um, you know, listening to Costas and kind of thinking, oh man, I should totally only look at practices that are 300,000 and then listening to, you know, uh, Jason Patrick Wood talk about, oh, well, you should shoot for 800. And, and the balance for me is probably somewhere in the middle, you know, it's, is, um, and then understanding where you're at, like, is this your first practice purchase? Um, if so, maybe a more traditional route, maybe a broker route, um, might be a better, a better option. Whereas if, if you're really experienced and you can do, um, you can come up with creative financing options and that sort of thing, then, maybe it makes more sense at that point to, um, you know, to, to use your network a little bit more and approach, um, kind of off market, um, buyers. No, for sellers. sure. For sure. And, and it does take a little bit of savvy and it takes a little bit of finesse. And if, and if they don't know what they're doing and you don't know what you're doing, uh, oh, blind leading the blind. Oh yeah, totally. So, <laughs> which, which is also another great way to wrap up this metasode of you and I, who've not done any of these things, uh, to, to then turn around and <laughs> share some great content and talk about it. So oh, yeah, yep. uh, this, this has been a lot of fun. I think, uh, I enjoyed this. Hopefully that other people in our audience, uh, got a lot out of this bringing together different perspectives on the same topic and, and kind of piecing together um, some great clips. I I really really appreciate you helping me out with this because you know and that ultimately that's why we're doing this together. Is is if I were to find some funny you know established dentist, he, I would still have to do all the work and I don't have time. And, and so, <laughs> so you're, you're so that's you're, the yeah my saving grace is that I have a lot more time. Yeah, you're and, and you're you're ambitious enough to do <laughs> do all the work and piece all these oh. together. So you're. Your cheap labor at this point, so. Oh yeah, well, I only listened to three episodes, so. I don't well, that's true. Episodes. Yeah, you, well, you know, you <laughs> get away with what you can. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, awesome. I'm I'm super excited, and you've put together uh, another one of these metasodes that we'll dive into later. It's uh, what was that one on for for our yeah. audience? Sure, let's give them a teaser. So the next one will be on uh, corporate dentistry. Awesome. So big scary words. So uh, we're ready to jump into that. Sweet. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been episode. 11 of the Shared Practices podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lowe and Jake Stimmel.